Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. And now, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 12 of Genesis chapter 14. We're going to begin reading in verse 7. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazion Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim, with Chedolamimer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, And they that remain fled to the mountain, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. I'll stop reading there. Now, um, as we have been considering this passage, we've seen that the battle relates to, spiritually, the the battle that occurs at the time of the end when the church age comes to a close and judgment begins at the house of God. And at that point in history, and, and as we know today, presently, we're looking at that point in history uh, as a past event, of course, at the time God was writing Genesis 14 and and having Moses write it down it was a, a an event that would take place far in um in the future but from our particular vantage point of living on the earth in the day of judgment in those days after the tribulation the great tribulation is now a past event and that helps us to see very well when we look at these kinds of historical parables exactly what's in view. And in this case, it's a battle, a a battle between the forces of Satan against the corporate church that used to have God as its protector, used to have God as the one who would ward off the fowls of the heaven and 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 keep them but no longer because god turned them over into the hands of satan he delivered them up to be judged and and so that's the situation here we have the forces of the enemy coming against City states that spiritually identify with the corporate church, and yet God is with neither side. God is fighting against, uh, we could say, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam, Zeboam, and, and Zoar, who is joined together with them, and, and who represents the elect that happened to be within the corporate church at the time that God delivered it up. Well, the Lord will take care of that remnant later on when he he commands his people to come out of the churches and congregations. But at this point, it's all wrath. It's all judgment. Verse 7 of Genesis 14 says, And they returned and came to En Mishpat. And En Mishpat is 5880 in Strong's Concordance in the Hebrew, and it literally means fountain of judgment. Fountain is a, a word that would identify with water. 
but in this case, it's all um, connected to the wrath of God, to judgment. And we'll see um, how, how that also identifies later with the slime pits in the veil of Siddim. But uh, verse 7, since the battle is uh, taking place, its location is in Mishpat, which is Kadesh. And, um, well, we, we won't get into what um, Kadesh means except to say that it's the identical word to sodomite and to uh, that which has been translated as unclean. And, and, and so they're, they're spiritually, uh, God is indicating that this is not a wholesome battle. It's not a holy war of any kind. It, it's, again, similar to the king of the south and the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11. Both kings do wickedly, and so too here as well. Well, it, it's in uh, and Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Heziazan Tamar. And then in verse 8, and there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboam and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of or the Valley of Siddim. And we saw a uh, similar language in verse 3. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. And we mentioned at that time, when we looked at that verse, that God was relating the Vale of Siddim to the Salt Sea, and salt has to do with judgment. So, it's said to be at the Salt Sea. It's said to be uh, in Mishpat, the fountain of judgment. And this is the place that they are joining the battle together. And when we look up um, the Hebrew word translated as joined battle, as it's found in verse 8 here, they join battle with them. We find it's translated as put in an array. In regards to battle, in a couple of significant places, one place is in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and the first couple of verses. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array, or join battle, against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. Now, in this case, the Philistines, who were always the enemies of the people of God, the enemies of Israel, and they would identify with the forces of Satan. They are fighting against Israel, but at this point in history, God is fighting against Israel also because of their unfaithfulness and their rebellion against his word. And so in this battle, the Israelites lose. They then bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battle thinking um, superstitiously or, or trying to really use the ark like it was some kind of an idol, that if they brought that which represented God, then God would be with them. But God permitted the Philistines to take the ark and to defeat Israel in the battle. It was a terrible day in Israel. The army lost the war. The Ark of the Covenant was taken captive by the heathen nation of, of Philistine. And it was a, a time when Eli's sons were also slain. And Eli, upon hearing the news 
fell over backwards and broke his neck. And, and to have a broken neck was an indicator of being under the wrath of God. And in addition to that, uh, one of the sons of Eli's wife had a child and she named him Ichabod, which meant the glory has departed from Israel. Everything about that day spiritually pointed to the time of judgment beginning at the house of God during the great tribulation period that would come at the end of the world. And, and, and so the Philistines were set in array. They joined battle with Israel, and God was not with Israel. Very similar to the historical situation we have in Genesis 14, two forces coming together, allies on one side against allies on another, and God is with neither one. He, he is not fighting against his enemies and supporting those that would we would think would have identification with him. Another place that this same word is used is in Jeremiah chapter 6. In a similar spiritual relationship or, or in a similar type spiritual teaching, in Jeremiah 6, verse 22, Thus saith Jehovah, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and this would be Babylon, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array or join to battle as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. And again, when Babylon joined battle against Judah, same spiritual picture as the Philistines coming against Israel at the time the ark was captured, and same spiritual picture as we have in Genesis 14. It is the picture of God giving up his people and turning them over into the hands of the enemy for rebuke and, and wrath and for punishment as the enemy will act as servant to God in carrying out the punishment that the Lord has determined. Okay, so here the these kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth join battle with them in the veil of Siddim. And then it says in verses 9 and 10, with Chedolamimer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And as we've already discussed, these four kings identify with the four beasts that describe Satan's rule during the Great Tribulation period. Then in verse 10, in the Vale of Siddim, the Valley of Siddim, and by the way, Siddim is a word that means land or country. So Valley of the Land or Valley of the Country, we could understand that to mean. And the Vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remain fled to the mountain. So they do battle in this valley of Siddim, and there happen to be um, slime pits in the valley. And it was, again, by the Salt Sea. Maybe that partly explains why the slime pits were found there. I don't know. But when we look at the word slime pits, we know, first of all, as it does have the word slime, and the word slime is 2564 in Strong's Concordance, found three times as part of this word here, slime pit, and two other times, uh, once in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 2. And verse 3, 
And when she could no longer hide him, that's referring to the baby Moses, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And the other place is in Genesis 11, Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. So this is the word that is found in this verse 10 where the battle was taking place and it's near the Salt Sea. It's uh, also identified with the Fountain of Judgment and Mishpat. And it's full of slime pits and slime uh, to daub the ark that could float or to make brick. It, it, it would be exactly as we understand it, a slimy, miry type substance that one could sink into. And the word pit actually the uh, English word slime pits, it consists of the word slime and the word pit, uh, which is 875, twice. It, it's actually pit, pit. And this word translated as pit is found translated that way about four times. But the same word is translated as well 29 times. It's the word, for instance, in Genesis chapter 21 in verse 19, and God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. The word well is the word pit. She saw a pit of water 29 times where we see the word well and and it's used uh, often in the book of Genesis. It is the same Hebrew word translated as pit in this verse. And, And so a well, we understand, is a deep ditch. It's a hole in the ground. You have to dig Uh, deeply into the ground in order to find the water beneath. And when uh, they would dig a hole in the ground and water would be located, it became a well of water. Remember, we pointed out, and mishpat means fountain of judgment. And and a fountain is a similar idea as to a well. uh, Fountains also produce water. And, and so here in the Valley of Siddim, in the Valley of the Land, they find it is full of slime pits or slime pit pit. It, it, the word is doubled. The, the same Hebrew word is doubled. And God does this actually more often than we might realize in the Bible. For instance, earlier in the book of Genesis, um, when the Lord said, uh, when you eat of the tree, surely ye will die. The, the word die was doubled. Surely eating, you will die, die. Or, and, and that's what actually why God translated, surely you will die, because it was making it more definite. When a word is doubled like that, it's adding strong emphasis to what God has said. Surely you will die. It, it's a certain death if you eat of the tree of the forbidden fruit. And here it is doubled as far as the word pit. It, it is indicating this is a deep hole. It's a deep trench. And we would say, if it weren't for the word slime, that it was a well. It was a, a well that God had doubled. He, he used the word twice. B- 
But because we have the word slime, we don't view it as being a well of water. You wouldn't find slime in a well of water. No, uh, this word pit, or the same Hebrew word translated as well or pit, is translated as pit also in Psalm 69. Psalm 69, beginning in verse 14, and Psalm 69 is a messianic psalm. Very clearly, there are uh, portions of this psalm that clearly identify with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross. And it says in verse 14, Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. And that's the same word, pit, translated in Genesis 14. Actually, uh, we, we have a few different figures. We have the mire, sinking in mire. And then there's also an image of drowning in deep water and, and the water flood overflowing because they're all figures of the same thing, coming under the wrath of God. And so the pit has to do with being under the wrath of God. If you are in a pit as Christ experienced the wrath of God, at the foundation of the world and paying for sin. And then he experienced it at the cross and demonstrating that payment for sin. Then the idea of being in a pit can be used. We find also in Jeremiah chapter 38, this word mire is found here in Jeremiah 38. In verse 6, then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Mount Chaya, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. So there we can see, um, as Psalm 69 mentioned, sinking in the mire, in a pit. Here in, in Jeremiah 38, it, it's a historical occurrence. And so there's no water in view, no water at all. It would just be um, a, a muddy, miry bottom to this dungeon. They called it a dungeon. It was just a hole in the ground, a pit. And they cast Jeremiah into it. And it was, it was so muddy or so lacking any solidness that he began to sink like quicksand into the mire. And that's the idea that's in Genesis 14 in the Vale of Siddim as it was full of slime pits. It's language that is revealing that there are wells, pits, but wells without water. They're, they're full of slime, and you would sink in them, just as Christ was sinking in the mire, that was the uh, typology God was using, to point to being under the wrath of God, and also to point to the fact that there is no mercy, there is no water of the gospel that will deliver anyone in this battle that's taking place. And that is exactly the picture or the, the truth of the situation when God began judgment upon the house of God. At that time when God loosed Satan and turned over the corporate church, that is, every church and congregation in all the world, into his hands and, and basically serve them up 
to be judged and to be destroyed spiritually by the forces of Satan, Gog and Magog, there was no gospel water from May 21, 1988 for 2300 evening mornings. There would be virtually no one saved anywhere in the world and absolutely no one saved in any congregation in all the outward churches and congregations of the world. There was no salvation taking place because the Holy Spirit left and abandoned them and and gave them up for judgment. Leaving, again, the churches are the scene of the spiritual battle, and the churches were the locations that previously, where there could be found, fountains of living water or wells of water that would have been springing up as the word of God went forth via the corporate church and individuals Uh, would have been drawn by the word of God into the various denominations and congregations, and God would have saved his elect remnant. They, They would have had drink from these fountains, from these wells of water, but no longer. Now, the church is the place of battle, the spiritual battle, and it's full of slime pits. It, it, it's just miry clay that individuals are sinking in. There is no water. And, and so we see that here in this verse in Genesis 14 in verse 10. All this language is uh, emphasizing very strongly of what God did when Uh, He removed the candlestick when he took away the light of the gospel from the churches and congregations of the world. Thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.